Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Last week, I was at Sasquan, the 73rd Annual World Science Fiction Convention in Spokane, Washington. Now, rather than doing a day-long video talking about all the things I did at the con, all the panels I went to, instead, I'm going to give the top three highlights and the bottom three lowlights of the convention. Why three of each? Well, from a purely technical standpoint, I'd like to keep this under an hour. As with all of my lists, these are in no particular order. Sort of. Number three, worst. I'm doing the worst first. Get the bad news out of the way. Rip the bandit off. Spread out hotels. I was lucky. I was able to secure a room at the Davenport Grand. A brand new hotel right across the street from the convention center with a sky bridge linking it to the convention center. I want to get back to that. Only two con hotels were so connected. My hotel and the Doubletree, which is also where the con suite was. This led to the other fact of my being lucky. The con suite being in the Doubletree, which only has three elevators, means there was massive lines to get to the elevators to go to the con suite. Because there was no way to take the stairs up to the con suite. What makes this a worst, and admittedly minor worst, is how far apart the other two major hotels, the Davenport Tower and the historic Davenport, are from each other. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a ten minute walk from the convention center to the historic Davenport, which is where the meet and greets and room parties were. And about a similar walk to the tower. Now, this on its own is not unnecessary. Not unnecessary in terms of it, it's not a bad walking length. It's you can go outside and get some exercise under normal circumstances. That's not a problem. It's kind of rough when you are out at night in a city that you're not necessarily familiar with. In general. For other attendees, this can also be a problem. Um, but this is somewhat aggravated by an issue which you'll get to under number one. That said, there is nothing the con committee can do about this. And I clearly admit that this item is basically on the list because I wanted to have an equal number of good things and bad things to talk about. My good things outweigh the bad, and I could probably go on and on at even greater length with the good things. But well, I wanted to balance this out a bit. Number two worst. The puppy problem. By way of explanation for those who have not been following the news around Worldcon, the Hugo Award nominations, there were two groups that put together slates of works which they wished to put on the Hugo ballot. The sad puppies and the rabbit puppies. Now, a slate, if you aren't familiar with the problem, with the concept for award nomination is a list of works that people are asked to or required by the people who are sponsoring this slate or creating the slate to nominate for award for an award. This isn't a recommended viewing list well, um, or reading list or what have you. This isn't like someone going, oh, I think that you should nominate this work or these works for your award. Um, or I think you should consider these works rather for your award. Check out these books, check out these comics, check out these films. I think you might enjoy them. I think you might consider them worthy of nomination. That is the, the accustomed preferred way. A reading list viewing list. This in particular is the problem with the slate is the people doing the slate aren't asking you to read the works, aren't asking you to watch the films. They're saying nominate these things on this list because we are a political cause we're fighting for. Um, I feel for an award that is about excellence in the genres of science fiction and fantasy, a slate kind of, the sl concept of the slate undermines that. Had what the puppies was doing be put forward a reading list. Is, these are the works that fit our political aims and we think are worthy of nomination. Please check these out. 
And if you enjoy them the way we do, not please put them for, for a denomination. If it was something like that, there would have been little to no objection. Or at least, yeah, there might be some objection, which reason we'll get to. The problem also was the motivation behind the slates. Now, for the sad puppies, I have a certain degree of empathy with them. Their purpose was that they felt that the Hugos were snubbing, for lack of a better term, mainstream science fiction. That they were potentially at risk of becoming like... How, for the Academy Awards, you have... Mainstream successful films don't necessarily get nominated. You won't see Guardians of the Galaxy get nominated for Best Picture. You'll get films... You get the whole complaints about Oscar bait films. And there's concerns about the Hugos getting into the territory of Hugo bait works. Um, That they were focusing on the odd, the experimental, over novels that were just plain fun reads. And... That's something that would help you sit back and relax through after a rough day. Something like that wouldn't get nominated anymore. And while I have some empathy for this, I do disagree. For example, Ancillary Sword, one of this year's nominees, is a book which is in the classic space opera tradition of the agent of the interstellar empire who rolls into town on their spaceship find corruption related to the evil black hats in positions of power and shoots the bad guys with their ray gun. I'm not going to get too much into detail about the plot of Ancillary Sword because it came out last year and I don't want to spoil it. Spoilers are bad. However, what makes it different and why it got nominated is because the author, Anne Leckie, plays the formula in ways where she has a very different setting with things like the Ancillaries. In fact, their main character is an ancillary, and what that means. Um, how our main character, the Justice of Tor- Justice of Torin, uses pronouns, or for that matter, the prevalence of the main character and who she is. That she is a essentially the conscious of a spaceship that has been destroyed and is remaining in a physical body. Um, it does a whole bunch of interesting, exper- interesting, neat stuff with that good old concept, while still maintaining what makes that narrative space opera idea work and we get a really good story out of it similarly the Whitley book that won the Hugo Award Three Body Problem is a very tense taut science fiction suspense thriller um, it's not in space but it has it uses a lot of great suspense thriller elements and great world building um, in the sense of how this future China is but also in terms of if you're if you didn't grow up in, if you're not familiar with Maoist Chinese history, building up on that down um, on its own and how it influences the main story of the setting, um, it all combines to a very interesting adventure with a great, wonderful narrative. And while it's not necessarily your typical mainstream science fiction, it is a translated work. It is worth checking out, and it, I would say that its win is justified. It also bears mentioning for previous years where the puppy's slate has been in existence, stuff like, for example, All You Need Is Kill, which was adapted into the novel, uh, into the film Edge of Tomorrow, which was nominated for a Hugo this year. That book didn't get, not, didn't get included on slates, or for that matter, nominated in general. But this leads me to the rabbit puppies. Them, I have no empathy for. The person behind them, who uses the pen name Fox Day, he's a racist and a misogynist, and he has no, puts no bones about it. He doesn't hide this fact. He is open about, on these points. Um... And it is unfortunate that the supporters that the Rabbit Puppies got behind them got more of the Rabbit Puppy slate nominated than the unique members of the Sad Puppy slate. Or, for that matter, in some categories with the uh, uh, people who aren't affiliated with the puppies in in general. I'm going to call them non-puppies. How about the kittens? Anyway. Um, (sighs) 
And this leads to the problem is the works that the Rabid Puppies nominated, with the exceptions of the best dramatic presentation, long and short form categories, and the Jim Butcher Dresden Files novel that got lumped into all of this, with those exceptions, the works they nominated are not good. At best, they are mediocre. At worst, they are actually terrible. And that, in a lot of the way, a lot of reasons, is what led to the push for a lot of these works getting awarded no award. Because in many cases, some of these works, particularly in like the best related works category, aren't great. I mean, they may be a certain degree enjoyable, but not I wouldn't describe them in any stretch as award award worthy, at least not Hugo Award worthy. Um this leads to the other problem with the whole mess with the puppies this year. Because of the connected drama connected drama related to this, there was a certain degree of vibe at the world con where i felt like everyone was kind of walking on eggshells not just for lack of a better term the kittens the term i just made up for people who aren't puppies i have no doubt the puppies themselves had their own degree of tension and when it came to interacting with people at the convention because of the disapproval of their slates and but i go to conventions especially this world con i went because i wanted to meet new people and make friends I, to a certain degree, kind of was able to do that, but not to the extent that I wanted to, because of all this canine-related tension. I met some new people, I think I hit it off, but I never really hit a point where I felt like this is someone who I'm going to be getting in touch with after the con, or anything like that, that if these people who I met were in town, we would get in touch with each other and meet up, or that sort of thing. There's nothing quite like that. It added this whole, it wasn't terrible, but this kind of haze of awkward over the entire affair. Which leads me to the number one problem, number one thing that was bad about Sasquatch. And this, again, this is something which no one had any control over. And that's the smoke. While Sasquatch was going on, Eastern Washington was on fire. Might be exaggerating. Massive swaths of Washington State, pretty much a whole counties to the north and west of Spokane, were on fire. To a degree that when I left to go home, the state was putting out an open call for volunteer firefighters to come help. Even if these people had, even if you were, had no training whatsoever, they're just saying, hey, are you a warm body? Can we train you to help on fire lines? We're bring then great. Here you go. Um, this is beyond the governor of the state of Washington declaring a state of emergency so that they can get assistance from other states' national guards. And what this meant is that for the entire, for almost the entire convention, Spokane had a constant layer of smoke on the sky over the city to the point that it looked like it was overcast. Except those aren't rain clouds; that's smoke. Further, there was constant haze in the streets itself to the point on. Friday, where it reaches absolute thickness, that it got so bad that there are signs being placed on the outside facing doors of the convention center, the doors to go outside, warning people, don't go outside, the air is hazardous for your to your health. There's simply no way to avoid it. In particular on Friday, the air, the smoke would get into the convention center when people went in and out because people had to go in and out because not all of the hotels were linked by sky bridges. You had to go out to get to your shuttle. You had to go out to wait for your shuttle. And the, um, for lack of a term, concert hall, where we had the masquerade and the Hugo Awards ceremony was not directly linked through a enclosed passageway or sky bridge or anything else like that, which means you had to go out to go to the masquerade on Friday. So, there's that problem. Um, 
And really, there's nothing you could do to deal with the literally, act, literally unpleasant atmosphere. Short of, I guess, trying to make the air pressure in the convention center higher than the air pressure outside. So, when you open the door, things blew out instead of, instead of coming in. But I'm not sure how you could just safely and healthily do that. Particularly without having the doors try to pop open. So with the unpleasantness out of the way, with the band-aid ripped off, let's get on to the actually fun parts of Worldcon. Number three best, meeting authors. Now sure, you can meet authors at your local science fiction convention, or when they come around to your city for a book signing. At a Worldcon, though, things are different. First, at a bookstore, to be blunt... They and they tend to frown on you bringing your well loved copy of an author's first edition, which you had when it first came out and you read the heck out of, um, and you've owned since you were a kid. It's frowned on them taking uh, on you bringing that in. They want you to buy books in the store. That's why they're bringing the author in. It's to promote the author's book and to get the get new get people to buy it. Um, similar, and with local cons, you may get some big names, one or two, but you don't necessarily get a bulk of big names. World con, for science fiction writers, they write science fiction because they love science fiction, and in many cases, these writers, when they got their start, or, or before they got their start, they were going to science fiction conventions like Worldcon, in particular, they wanted to go to Worldcon as soon as they find out what found out what it was. So you get these big names like Larry Niven, Robert Silverberg, and up and coming writers like Martha Wells all coming together in one place because they write science fiction. They love science fiction, and Worldcon is the place where you get this critical mass of science fiction fans from all across the world, which we'll get back to later. Um, Additionally, part of this is you're more likely to meet international authors. British authors like Charles, like, uh, Charles Strauss are there. Um, and probably as a great example, excuse me, I'll we'll reach back for a second. I picked up from the Hikosoru booth Gene Mapper by, I'm going to mangle his last name, Taiyo Fuji. And by my good fortune, I was stringing by the booth when the author was there and I was able to get the book signed and actually was able to go to a couple panels that the author was on and chat with him and I think we hit it off um, and I would really not have gotten an opportunity like this at Oricon or Comoricon or any of my more local science fiction or fantasy or gaming conventions and just on its own with that factor point there that really brings up what makes Worldcon great. However, if you're into cosplay, the next big thing worth mentioning is the masquerade. I don't cosplay by myself, but I do enjoy seeing quality cosplay. I appreciate all the hard work that goes into researching and preparing the costumes for ones that are adapted costumes, or planning out what a costume would look like for ones where there is no artistic representation of the character already. Like, for example, before Dune came out, figuring out what the still suits look like on Dune. Um, if you're making the costume with clothes off of the rack, there's still a certain degree of research and planning and contemplation that needs to be done to figure out what you need to put the costume together. However, while I've seen some excellent costumes at Comoricon and, War and Oricon, and they have been damn good, Worldcon's masquerade blew my mind. Um, particularly like light costumes. There were some excellent costumes using light in various different ways through electric elements, like um, like lights in built into weapons or parts of the costume, or or just simply glow in the dark elements on the outfit using glow in the dark materials. Um, Additionally, the sort of halftime performance during the masquerade was by the field guest of honor, Tom Smith, 
I had seen him perform on the first night of convention where he uh, they, they do a first night celebration to kind of introduce everyone and get them in, interested, get them hyped up. And there, Smith, let me go for a second. Oh, it's closed. Sorry. Smith um, was performing pieces of music inspired by sketches being done by Phil Foglio. So it's basically, it's and Smith sort of writing music on the fly. Now, um, the performance by Smith during the Masquerade is just a step above that. Not just a step, many steps above that. Um, it is a cliche to say when, about a performance that you enjoyed, I laughed, I cried. But I kind of both laughed and cried. His comedic filks are absolutely hilarious. And the middle of his performance featured a song written by the perspective of Kerm, written from the perspective of Kermit the Frog, coping with the death of Jim Henson, which was then followed up by a performance of the song Rainbow Connection. I think it, there, there may have been. I mean, this is the, the smokiest day of the convention. It's entirely possible some smoke got into the theater and caused everyone to tear up. But I think a probably more reasonable situation is that everyone got all teary eyed. So. Yeah, there's that. Um, so what I think is for my number one, and it's tough for you to find the one thing I think is best about WorldCon, is the fact that at WorldCon you really are meeting fans from around the world. It truly is a WorldCon. There are fans there from the U.S., from Canada, the U.K., Ireland, Australia, all throughout Europe, um, and as I talked about under the authors. Uh, Japan and China. More than getting the privilege and honor to nominate works for and vote for works in the Hugo, to, to try to share with everyone, this is the works of science fiction that I think are the best from the past year. It is even better to meet face-to-face -face with fans who've traveled from all over the world and come to this one place out of their love for science fiction and fantasy. The only conventions that really come close, at least in the United States, are Anime Expo and Otakon for anime, and Gen Con for tabletop gaming. I'm starting to agree Penny Arcade Expo, but that's kind of getting dispersed through to the through the franchisation of PAX. This convention is, in many ways, a snapshot of the global community of fandom all in one place. Um, I had the honor of meeting other fanzine writers, web series producers. Um, I went to a panel where I met with a writer who read my, who read my fanzine. It wasn't like, oh, hey, I write this fanzine. I don't know if you've heard about it. And they said, yes. No, no, it's... The author approached me and said, hey, are you the guy who does this fanzine? I really like your stuff. And that floored me. That really made my day. You, you Stuff like that doesn't happen often. Um... It's something that never has happened at any of my of the local conventions I've been at. Uh, it's something that hasn't happened at um, and the one time I went to San Diego Comic Con. This it's a truly extraordinary thing to go to a World Con, and if you ever get the opportunity to go, I really recommend doing it. Um, next year's World Con is in Kansas City, Missouri, and in 2017 it will be in Helsinki, Finland. If you are able to go, if you can afford the membership and hotel stay and all that sort of stuff, I would definitely recommend going. It is worth it. I think you will have fun. So, with that spiel done, and we've talked, I've talked for almost half an hour, I could probably talk for another half an hour more. I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please support my Patreon. Um, or toss some money in the tip jar up here. If you're on the face on the uh, YouTube channel page. And one, next week will be the next installment of Nintendo Power Retrospectives. And week after that... Well, we'll see what happens. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.